Hi, and welcome to Belaboring the Point. I'm your host, Kate Riga. Today, I'm here with TPM's own Josh Marshall. We just wrapped up a conversation with Professor Heather Cox Richardson about, you know, kind of the state of America, how we got here, um, some of the historical roots. And I thought the conversation, much like her book, was so fascinating. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, no, I, 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 both. I, I, I thought, you know, we, we, we initially, we, we were scheduled to just uh, talk for a half hour, um, but we ended up doing, you know, basically close to our normal ep- episode length, I think a touch shorter than an hour, but there was just so much to talk about. Um, and, you know, her, her book is, it, it, a lot of it is history, but it is very much about explaining the current moment in our history. And they're, they're, it's, it's very elucidating. And, and as I think you mentioned at one point towards the end of the conversation, ended up being more kind of uplifting than, than maybe we thought it would, you know, maybe we thought it would be because there's, there's obviously a lot of storm clouds on the political horizon right now. But it was, it was, it was very interesting. And it was also interesting to me because it gave me a lot to think about about the interplay of being a scholar um, and also being a writer in, in, in the public, you know, in, 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 in the public space, which is something that she has managed to excel at both, which is a very impressive, but it was interesting to me to think about how the two kinds of work play off each other. And, and to some extent how they uh, you know, there's only so much, only so many hours in a day, but also how they kind of, you know, nourish each other in a, in a, in a basic way. So it was, I thought it was a really interesting conversation and uh, a really good book, which, which I, I really recommend you pick up a copy of it. And I, I assume many of our, many of our listeners are also subscribers to uh, Heather's Substack. So um, you, yeah. in some cases, you know about the book, but if you don't, you should really get a copy. The narrative thread that I was really glad we got it to get into was, you know, it's this fundamental question of, you know, Trump isn't new. He's just a a symptom of this decay that we've had for a long time. And I was really glad that we got into that both from the perspective of like way back in kind of American history and then also the pieces that have led directly to our environment today, which is, you know, in the in the mid 80s, how Republicans kind of realized that their ideas were very unpopular and then developed the different mechanisms to entrench minority rule no matter what, you know, and and then that, how that's a direct line to the 2010 gerrymandering projects and Citizen United and all, all of that. It's just so, it's so nice to be able to kind of see everything from the 3000 foot view and see how one thing led to another, led to another. And in some weird way, even though it, it, the thread is tugging back on some of the ugliest periods of American history, I did find it almost comforting this idea, at least that Trump is not some kind of, you know, aberration out of nowhere from a different planet. We've never seen the likes of him before. This is an entirely new dynamic because even though there are new things about him, you can kind of tap into these veins in American history, which to me, while they don't really lessen the crisis we're in, they at least give us some context and maybe some even some, you know, kind of grace notes of, of moments where we've been faced with kind of the threat of authoritarianism before and, you know, not, not succumb completely or fell back on, you know, what I think is kind of the thesis of her book, which is incredibly optimistic. This idea that the people who have been kind of left out of the American dream, pushing back on it and insisting that, you know, democracy be expanded to include them has always been the kind of saving grace of, of this country. Yeah, I think, a, you know, a related, I mean, in some ways the same point, but a, a different dimension of it that we talked about. There's been, in the Trump era, there has been a kind of competition uh, among anti-Trump voices of people always, you know, if anybody says, oh, this is so bad, it's unprecedented, it's, it's there's there's a certain knowing voice saying, oh, well, you just didn't see it coming it's always been this way, or it's been, you didn't see the early signs. It's been building to this, building to this for decades. Um, and there, there are, 
there's there's a lot of truth in both of those things. Um, but if if you really play that out, if it's a if it's this kind of unidirectional path leading leading to this moment, well, that doesn't that is both I think inaccurate historically. Um, it it shortchanges the, the the highly contingent nature of history and the fact that uh, we don't know what happens next. It's 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 kind of bad history and it's also not a very optimistic outlook, right? Um, and so I think on both of those counts, uh, Heather's good at um, noting those roots, explaining those roots, explaining how we got here uh, without being deterministic or fatalistic about where we go next. Exactly. Okay, so here's our conversation with Heather Cox Richardson. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, and welcome to Belaboring the Point. I'm your host, Kate Riga. Today, I'm joined by TPM's Josh Marshall to chat with Heather Cox Richardson. Heather is a professor of history at Boston College. She's written about the Civil War, Reconstruction, the Gilded Age, and the American West in award-winning books whose subjects stretch from the European settlement of the North American continent to the history of the Republican Party through the Trump administration. Her most recent book, Out Now, is called Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. Heather, thank you so much for joining us. Josh and I are both great admirers of your work. It is such a pleasure to be here with you too. So Josh is going to kick us off with a question about, you know, kind of the two hats you wear in your daily work. So, yeah. So, you know, we were alluding to this a little before we started recording. You know, when I was in graduate school and, you know, kind of graduate school to be a historian, what you have made your career in, when I was doing that, I kind of figured out, I don't know, halfway through that I I wanted to also be a public writer in some sense, a journalist. And as I was struggling to figure out what to do with my life, what to do with my professional life, I had a point when it kind of occurred to me, at least about myself, that if I tried to do both, I would be sort of half-assed at both and not at least not give myself a shot at really being good at either one. Now, you are um, sort of shaming me by doing that. Right. You're you have a, a distinguished career as an historian and you you are an incredibly uh, successful public writer. So I want to ask you, do you how has that worked and has has that has the time you now devote um, to being a public writer? Has that pulled away time from your scholarship? Do, are, do they are they intention? Are they? Um, are they sort of nourishing each other? How have you experienced that, doing both? I think the way to look at what I do is to take an even bigger step back and recognize that absolutely everything I do, no matter where it is in the public sphere or whether it's really deeply academic stuff, is acting as a teacher. So that's, a, that's the first line right there. So I never think of myself as a journalist. I think of myself as a historian with the, the, the difference being that, as you know, journalists tell you what happened. And historians study how and why societies change. So we are deeply rooted in theory, of course, but we also have strong ideas about what creates change in society. So when I write about the modern world, what I am trying to do is teach you know, literally say, okay, here's what the Ways and Means Committee does, and this is why it's important. Or here's what's happening in Ukraine right now, and here's why it's important. Here's how it's changing society. It is not a comprehensive view of every single thing that happened in America today, because a lot of that to me doesn't really matter. I'm trying to look for the longer, the longer period, the longer threads of what's going, of what's changing society. So I think it's important to think about what I do as teaching in different formats and with teaching with the idea of helping people to understand how societies change and their opinions about that can be very different than mine. So that I think is how I put those two things together. But the second part of your question, what has this done to my own scholarship is really interesting. And it's one that, that, that a little bit keeps me up at night. That is, there's not a single day that goes by that I don't learn something new. 
something that I have to do a deep dive on to figure out, you know, what was happening and why did things happen and what are the documents that mattered? Who are the people that mattered? All those different pieces. But I love doing historical research. I love you know, the, the congressional record from the 19th century is my happy place. <laughs> and there are two projects underway right now that I just miss. I just would love to be doing that, you know, several hours a day. And it's not physically possible right now. And one of the things that I would like to do going forward now that Democracy Awakening is off my desk is find a way to build in at least a couple hours a day where I get to do that. I get to go back into you know, right, you know, earlier this, this summer, I was sort of obsessed with Martin Van Buren. Well, you know, that's not something that most of the public cares about, but I do. <laughs> and I would like to do that again. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's, it's easy for people to forget that any single person has just, you know, there are an absolute number of hours in the day. And I guess it, my experience in the times where I've, where I have worked on side projects that have, you know, kind of taken me into a, a, a different space. It's not just a matter of hours in the day, but you have to have a certain amount of, you know, you can't drop in for a half hour of history research a day. You've got to build up some, some critical mass. Uh, but it's interesting that you, that, that, that you're thinking of doing that, at least getting segmenting off some amount of time to do what, you know, your, your, your history research work on an, on an ongoing basis. Well, yeah, that's what I'm really good at. And that's what I really love to do. And, you know, it's funny because until the last several years, I think if you looked at my reputation, what people would say more than anything is that I was really, really, really good at research. And, well, I think that really pays off in the letters from an American where I know where to look. And I'm always a little bit surprised when people say to me, you know, where did you find this? Because to me, it is such second nature to know where to go and to know how to dig down and to know what to trust. After all these years, I've been at it, of course, for a very long time. Um, that's That pays off, I think, with letters from an American, but it also seems a little bit of a loss to take somebody who does have that skill set and say, you know, you can't really do what you're best at any longer. And I hope that will come back. I mean, you know, if, if it, the day will come when we won't need these letters any longer and I will ride off into the sunset and I will ride off into the sunset straight to the congressional record from the 19th century <laughs> and eat M&Ms secretly. If anybody, libraries or librarians are listening, I would never, ever, ever do that in a library <laughs> and, um, and read all those documents again. So I want to jump into your book a little bit because I've been really fixated on this idea that you opened my eyes to that speed is a, a kind of a critical part of the strong man's achievement. This idea that if you like do things really quickly, people don't really have time to take stock of everything that's going on. And then reading your book and and remembering how fast things happened after Trump was elected, like that the Muslim ban was weeks after inauguration. Um, can you kind of talk about that dynamic and where we are now in a in a really fast to slowing down period? You know, did Trump, did Biden's election kind of interrupt that that fast clip momentum? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I've been thinking about this a lot lately as people are asking, what can they do about disinformation going into the 2024 election? And I used to teach at MIT many, many years ago, and, and just when the internet was starting, and one of the things that the MIT scientists told us to try and get us to avoid phishing schemes was, if anybody wants you to react to something immediately, they are... They, they don't have your best interests at heart. That mm -hmm. is any kind of a phishing scheme, any kind of an attempt to get your credit card information, any of those things, they're going to happen quickly. They're going to make you afraid that you're going to lose access to your accounts or that your kid has been kidnapped. They're going to try and hit you really quickly. And one of the things that I think people can do going into 2024 is not react to the news immediately. Give it at least a day, but probably two, because if you think about how many things recently have been you know, presented as this is an emergency that has to happen right now, and within two or three days, you realize that that story was not what it appeared to be. And you know, I don't know if your what your timing is for dropping this, but 
um, Josh's piece uh, two days ago, I think, about what happened to the um, the the university presidents in the in Congress, where you backed off and said, "Now wait a minute here, let's look at the longer clip. Let's look at what Stefanik was really up to when she dropped the clips the way she did." That would have been a very good thing for people to take a deep breath before they jumped into that story the way they did. So. I think in the short term, it's worth thinking about the, and, and always being aware of the fact that bad actors want your attention quickly and they want you to make quick decisions because quick decisions in the political realm are often bad ones. But you're referring to something that's a little bit larger. And that was that as soon as the former president, Donald Trump, took office in January of 2021, his Steves, as he called them, Steve Bannon and Steve Miller, <laughs> pushed through that travel ban. And the travel ban I maintained at the time was in a post I wrote, this before the Letters from an American, about shock events, which is really interesting because people thought I got that from Naomi, uh, Naomi Klein's work, but it was actually from um, my studies of indigenous history and what happened to indigenous society when disease came in as quickly as it did and how it completely destabilized society. So. Um, what they did is they came in and they threw that travel ban on the table so quickly and without any legal basis, and this is pretty well established, that literally there were people on planes who had been legal migrants to the United States when they got on the plane. And by the time they got off the plane, they were banned. And if you remember people rushing to the airports to protect them and other people rushing to protest. And one of the things that happens with that kind of chaos is that people start to feel that there really has been a dramatic breakdown of society and be willing to use extra legal pol uh, police efforts um, to give extra powers to the president to really to really try and reestablish order. So, you know, one of the things that a strong man will do is try to, de you know, try to create a problem that he then says, only I can solve. Right. And it strikes me as you were talking that our kind of current media landscape is perfectly set up for these rapid fire, heaping up effects of these kind of chaotic stories that, that make it feel like we are in a, in a time of crisis. And that seemed to take away that time you're talking about to kind of re-examine the story and, and make sure that the first cut is the right cut. Because by that time, we're on to the next thing, right? Well, I'd be interested in what you, you have to say about this, because one of the things that I think feeds this in the United States right now is the media's eagerness to both to have scoops but also to cover Trump and what Trump is doing, because one of the things that always jumps out to me is the difference between those in the Trump camp who are really trying to shock us and those in the Biden camp and the Democrats who are actually making incremental steps that move society forward. But you know what? It's really not that interesting to read about how the Biden administration, for example, is trying to break up monopolies. It's not, you know, it's it's not a page turner yeah. and it doesn't get the even aside from any kind of politics behind how a reporter might be leaning in an election or thinking about presenting politics just in terms of getting people to react really hard to say hey look we filed a lawsuit you know as yeah. opposed to being like we're going to deport 10 million people totally and i think i mean that's kind of why we had this golden era of you know, tons of subscriptions to media companies and, and a really, um, you know, intensive time of really good investigative journalism during the Trump campaign. But sort of part of that was predicated by the idea that people were panicked and that it did feel like you had to be watching all the time or else, you know, he'd start a war overnight and you wouldn't you wouldn't be aware of what was going on. And I think that combined with what you're talking about of this, the scoop infrastructure, the getting clicks infrastructure, the getting eyeballs on your stories to create revenue streams infrastructure of the media does create these incentives where novelty is king, you know, novelty and shock value and exciting headlines that get people to click on them. And I think you're completely right. It just, it drives me crazy whenever people kind of say like, well, the Biden administration doesn't talk about their achievements enough. And maybe there's an argument to be made, but that completely ignores the asymmetry in our media landscape where you've got 
you know, kind of the right wing machine churning out the the Trump friendly propaganda all the time. And then, you know, what Biden's supposed to kind of rely on CNN to want to tell people about his new high speed rail investments. Like people aren't going to aren't going to click on that story, you know. So it, I think the bias towards novelty and negativity is are hugely dominant forces. Well, have you found that a talking points memo, though? Because, you know, I, as I was saying to Josh um, before we started, TPM was the first web blog I ever read um, a very long time ago now. I was in on the very, very early days. And where I really became a, a, a huge fan was with, with the U.S. attorney scandal. Mm -hmm. where, you know, nobody else was paying any attention to the fact that the George W. Bush administration was knocking off U.S. attorneys. And I remember, Josh, this is a very long time ago, I know, and it may have been lost in the ether, but I remember you writing to your readers and saying, if you know anything, let me know, and putting together, based on that crowdsourcing, this blockbuster story. And, you know, frankly, U.S. attorneys are not necessarily clickbait either. Well, I think, you know, one thing, uh, I, I do remember that. And one of the things that gave TPM a sort of an advantage and a lifeblood early on is that our readership in, in the form of emails gave us access to something that most people now would be familiar with by w through social media. One of the dimensions of social media, which is to say that um, in any uh in any moment, you know, you, you, it, it is a stream of news coming at you and you can be overwhelmed by it and, and, and be thrown off by it. But if you have a discerning eye, you can actually, it can be, it can be a huge resource. Um, you know, I have always been of the thinking that, you know, I, I think of our role in the media as newspapers in this country, you know, the, the fact that, that, that news, that, that, reporters and publishers are looking for a punch headline that's not, not that's not something new under the sun and 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 um journalists are trying to tell stories and ones that uh activate people's minds and play into the sort of the storytelling and story consuming instinct that that humans have so there's some aspect of that that i that I completely embrace. There's, but it's also the case that, as you say, there's that kind of hurry up, make a decision thing that is something kind of genetic to the disinformation, fake news ecosystem. I'm, I'm actually uh, reminded, you know, in 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 military modern military theory in the U.S. military, there's this thing called OODA loops which is this thing that this guy, uh, military intellectual, 30, 40 years ago came up with. And what, basically what it is, it's an acronym, blah, 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 blah. But it basically means if, you, if your side can move faster so that you are taking new actions when the other side is still in its decision process about its next, next actions, your actions can disrupt the other guy's decision process before he can act. And that builds on itself. And I think that we have, that's some of what Trump has been able to do over the last seven years. I mean, I saw it first when he was demolishing all the other Republican candidates back in, the, in, in late 2015 and early 2016. And if you looked at it, you know, there's the tweets and there's all this kind of stuff, but what it really was you had these traditional candidacies, and in a traditional candidacy, when you want to say something or you want to react to something, you get your people together, you agree on a press release, and you put it out. You get your people together, and you say you're going to do a, a, a press availability, and you do it. But Trump wasn't doing any of that. He was just going on Twitter or calling into newscasts. And and while the while the other side was react, you know, thinking about the next thing, he's off to the new thing, and that was you saw that happening, and that that was a particular story. But in many ways, we have seen that play out in a million. And you've mentioned how, in a variety of places in your book, fascism is about speed. It's about a, it's a hurry up political movement, um, and that's 
that's a I'm, I'm supposed to I'm supposed to be asking a totally different question now and Kate's going to get well, mad at me so I'll, I'll jump to that but I think that's just so basic to this, well but but there's another period. important thing that that maybe goes to something else you were going to ask and they can always cut this but Senator Joe McCarthy from Wisconsin pioneered this, of course. And, you know, Trump and he had the same advisor or the same mentor in Trump's case of Roy Cohn. And the difference between the 1950s and the 2000 teens was that the lawmakers in the Republican Party dealt with McCarthy. That is, the press never figured out how to cover McCarthy because that's exactly what he did. He would go out in front of the, the microphones and he would make some outrageous claim and they would feel that they had to cover it because it was an outrageous claim, even though they knew he was lying. And you, yet if you read about them, they have these long sort of monologues where they're like, we don't know what to do because we tried not covering him. And then people got mad because we weren't covering him. And, you yeah. know, and then of course, some of the, the press were bad actors who were actually egging him on and giving him sources and all that. But the lawmakers ultimately said, you are poisoning our system. And they, um, they, they, didn't, they didn't censure him. I, I, there was something weird about what they did, but they basically said, you're not welcome here any longer and we're not going to play this game. And one of the things that really jumps out about Trump's rise to me always is how much more certainly the the Republican senators could have done to stop him. And they simply refuse to. They refuse to now until mm -hmm. they step mm -hmm. out of the limelight. And I find that completely inexcusable. Yeah, it's a it's a it, absolutely a basic demand. Are we on to my question, Kate, or did you have a follow up? Nope, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a big question. Let me try to kind of boil it down to one thing. You know, through through your book, one of the basic questions there, and one that I think you answer is, is Trump, you know, is Trump an aberration, this kind of weird thing that happened versus something that he's a culmination of of of, of a long process. And 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 you start that long process in in the New Deal period. And then it also has, you know, take it up through Goldwater, Reagan, some key points, uh, Nixon, Brooks Brothers riot that I think we were, I, I can't remember if we just, if it came up when we were talking bef before we went on air. Let me ask you this. If, if Trump is something, represents something that is in the American DNA and always has been a sort of an authoritarian impulse that has always been there and is part of a, of a process going back almost 80 years or more than 80 years now. If we've been building to Trump, what is it that makes us think we will suddenly turn that process back and and kind of restore where we were? Isn't there, if, if we buy into the process of cumulative progression, isn't that, isn't that a pretty ominous, uh, isn't that a pretty ominous read for what comes next? And if not, why not? Well, it is ominous for sure. But what I think about when I think about Trump is that he is, in fact, the culmination of a long kind of rhetoric that Americans have indulged in since even before there was a United States of America. That idea that some people are better than others and have the right to rule. And that stands very deliberately against the idea that we are all created equal and have a right to have a say in our government, as is outlined in the Declaration of Independence. So that theme has always been there. What makes Trump different? So, so yes, I would say he's part of a continuity. What makes Trump different is that he took that theme, that rhetoric, and he turned it into a movement. Now, he's the first president or first major leader to have turned that rhetoric into a movement. And those are not the same things because the, the, the rhetoric, in his case, he married to the street gangs that have traditionally in the United States been the, the harbinger of neo-Nazism, for example, of right-wing authoritarianism. So he's unusual in that he took this theme and he turned it into a movement. So why does it seem to me that he is, it's not inevitable that we are going down the, the road of authoritarianism ultimately here? Well, first of all, because one of the things that I think is so freaking important to remember in any history, but certainly in American history, is that the future is not written. Mm 
You know, I get really frustrated by people who say it's all over, it's done, because it seems to me that that comes from a place of such extraordinary privilege. Because if in fact that man goes back into the White House or somebody like him goes into the White House, many, many people are going to be very, very badly hurt. And it is it it is up to those of us who, and maybe I would be one of the ones hurt. So it'd be up to those who are not going to be on the firing line that, you know, to step up and to protect those people who will not have that privilege. So first of all, that infuriates me. But second of all, um, the United States has, in fact, changed its history very, very quickly in the past. It's gone off that track really quickly. And the rise of the New Deal is one of those things. 1928, uh, it looked to everybody like the Republican project as it was uh, illustrated under Herbert Hoover was there forever, right? That everybody loved it and they'd gotten rid of poverty and America was going to go down this track forever in a day. By 1932, of course, we have FDR uh, who represents almost exactly the opposite, uh, uh, winning the White House and changing all of American history. That was a turn that happened on a dime. So what I would say is that in the United States, when we have had the the increasing power of that authoritarian strand until now, largely through rhetoric, although not entirely, certainly we'd have to look at the 1850s to, to as a, an example of a time when they went at least as far as um, as the far right wing has done in America now, ordinary Americans wake up and they say, listen, we, we don't agree with each other about many things, you know, immigration or finance or taxes or internal improvements or civil rights or any of the many things that Americans disagree about. But by God, we can agree that we are not going to become an oligarchy or an authoritarian state. And, you know, we've done it in the past and we've done it in the past in periods when only white propertyed men could vote. So I look at us now and I think, you know, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned about the fact that the, the radical right has sewn up what I would call the nodes of democracy, where people can, you know, who can vote and how votes are counted and, and they've got the electoral college in their favor. There's all kinds of ways in which we are, those of us who are trying to protect democracy up against the ropes. But when we have had this same sort of a situation in the past, when, as I say, only white property men could vote, we have turned that ship around. And now, of course, people of color and women can also vote. So the idea that it's a done deal now, I'm not ready to say that. It seems like a good intro to your next question, Kim. There's something that I <clears throat> has been troubling me since I was on the Hill covering the speakership election chaos, um, I guess like a month ago now. And it was this- Which this kind you of... did, which you did beautifully, by the way. Oh, you were who you. I followed. Thank you so much. But there was this twin effect where it was this kind of embarrassing, ludicrous, occasionally funny spectacle. And then it felt like there was this much darker underlying dynamic happening, which was the advancement real time of the kind of right flank of the Republican Party actively breaking the legislature. And it, it kind of made me think about how the quote unquote old school Republicans have been breaking the legislature for a long time, right? I mean, primarily through the filibuster, but we've long had a situation where even, you know, policies that are very popular among the American people can't make headway in Congress, whether that be the combination of, you know, gerrymandering, getting extremists into the House or special interests, um, all of those kind of dynamics. But I was wondering what you made of the of the speakership crisis and how do you think of the frequent kind of non-functionality of our legislature in terms of this growing authoritarian movement? Like is a withered legislature part of that effort? Uh, yes. And I, I'd love to talk about that, but I have to ask you the question that I feel certain everybody who is listening to this podcast wants to know. And that <laughs> is, why did the whole Republican conference break and go with Mike Johnson? Is it that, in fact, they thought he was a non-entity and it was just an easy way to get out of that incredibly embarrassing situation? Or, it's you know, did they intend to back this wacko right guy? No, I swear to God, I think the most potent factor at that moment was exhaustion. Like, 
members of Congress are such massive babies. I don't think the public has a true awareness that when they don't get to take, you know, they usually work three day weeks, right? And when there's any kind of infringement on that schedule, it's all of a sudden we have, well, time to cooperate, right? Because we want to go home for our two week Thanksgiving break. Um, And then also, this was the dynamic throughout the whole period was whatever creates the appearance of forward momentum that became the next thing that everyone clung to so that was the individual names but then it would also be you know after tom emmer went down okay how do we get forward momentum let's go back into conference and take another internal vote it was whatever made them look a little bit less just kind of spinning their wheels with no foreseeable plan and i really think mike johnson just emerged as someone new enough to have not pissed a lot of people off and someone who is kind of blandly amicable enough that people were like well you know it's, it's, he's not jim jordan right jim jordan who was felled by his own assholery mike johnson didn't reach that level and then of course we got what we have now which is the the sheer unvettedness of it all (laughs) did nobody think to at least google him i mean i think everyone knew that he was kind of a a right wing very christian guy but i don't know that there's a lot of internal realization within republicans that there are gradations within that and that some of those gradations would really freak people out as soon as you get him talking about the logistics of the arc, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, um, right. you, go ahead, Josh. Oh, I, I, I agree with, 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 uh, with, with what Kate said. I think just, I mean, it, it, it always seemed to me you were going to, I mean, there's two dynamics. One dynamic is that in a contest between rule followers and rule breakers, that's that contest ends before it starts. Um, and as, as, as long as the rule breakers were not going to be disallowed, you're going to, it's going to keep arcing in, in, in their direction. And the other point is just, you just needed to come up with someone who was both bland enough and relatively unknown enough that both the sort of the freedom caucus people and, you know, the handful of moderates in New York, look at that person and say like, eh, I barely, you know, okay. I, I don't even know what he's about. So, and, and we need to leave for vacation. So let's do it. And so I think Kate's exactly right. That would be a great piece, by the way. Um, yeah, and I don't, idea. and I don't think you've written it because I read you both religiously. <laughs> um, and that, that I know people have wondered about, and that's the only thing I could figure out is that they were just desperate to move forward. And so they picked, you know, somebody who could fog a mirror only to find <laughs> out that he was not okay. Right. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but so to go back to, to, the question that I completely ignored so that I could ask you that question. (laughs) So, yeah, I think that one of the things that really jumps out, if you look at the period in the United States, um, really beginning during the Reagan administration, and I'm going to pick 1986 as my date, the, what the, what the, and I want to emphasize they're not traditional Republicans, but what the movement conservatives who took over the Republican Party realized as early as 1986 is that their policies were not popular. You know, cutting regulation, cutting taxes, slashing social services, people did not like that. So as early as 1986, they did two things. They reached very aggressively toward bringing evangelical Christians, you know, thoroughly into their movement. That's not to say that people like Jerry Falwell weren't participating before that, but they really really make an aggressive move in 1986. And they also in 1986 begin voter suppression. And that idea of picking your own voters and gerrymandering and by uh, 2010 with Citizens United flooding the zone with as much dark money as you possibly can. What that did, I think, was it gave the Republicans such, uh, the extremist Republicans such a leg up that they don't any longer have to respond to the will of the American people, which has had all sorts of really interesting fallout since then. But the reason I think that they got away with that for so long is because it was incremental, because each little, you know, any little thing they did, they justified, you know, with some language that enough people were willing to accept that they managed to make it happen. And it reminds me, as I say, very much of the 1850s, where gradually the elite enslavers who came to take over the Democratic Party 
and then gradually came to take over not only their states, but the federal government by taking the Senate, by taking the White House, by taking the Supreme Court, by making inroads in the House of Representatives. You know, people really didn't pay attention to that until all of a sudden in 1854 with the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act that would have spread or did spread human enslavement into the American West, raising the possibility that new slave states in the American West could work with the slave states in the American South to overawe the free North in the House of Representatives, as well as they already were overawed in the Senate, and thereby make America a, a country based in human enslavement with the idea that they would spread that system around the globe because they were the wealthiest and most powerful people virtually in all the world. It was that Kansas-Nebraska Act that finally woke people up in the North, people like Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln, to, but not just him, to say, hey, hang on just a minute here, and then to look backward and say, wait a minute, they've been doing this for a long time. And that's, of course, where we get the House Divided speech, where Lincoln talks about how, you know, Roger, as in Roger Tawney at the head of the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and Stephen, as in Stephen Douglas, who put forward the Kansas-Nebraska Act, you know, how all these four these four major steps had created a, a, a house that was designed to be a house for enslavement. And, you know, one of the things that I've been playing with lately when I haven't been able to be doing, uh, you know, a deep dive into the American past is thinking, you know, what it would take in the United States for people to recognize that the same thing has been going on here for 40 years, the same, you know, a little bit shorter time in the 1850s, but for a long time. And I wonder if that's the Dobbs v. Jackson women's health decision, mm. because, you know, you think about the many, many times that Americans should have been horrified at what was happening. And I'm not just going to go with Citizens United in 2010, which, as I say, opened up the dark money floodgates, or um, Shelby versus Holder in 2013, which gutted the Voting Rights Act. But what I'm thinking about is Operation Red Map in the states in 2010, which gave the uh, Republicans control of state government so they could so thoroughly gerrymander states like North Carolina, for example, that the the Democrats couldn't win no matter how many votes they got, couldn't win control either of their congressional delegations or of their state houses. And those all just happened. I mean, lots of people have never even heard of Operation Red Map, but Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health overturning Roe versus Wade from 1973, which recognized a constitutional right. To have that recognition of that constitutional right taken away 50 years later and now seeing what's happened with, you know, the, the case where the, the young girl had to cross a state line in order to get an abortion or the recent cases in Texas where women were prevented from obtaining abortion care, even though they were carrying non-viable fetuses and their lives were in danger. That's the sort of thing where a lot of people who were like, it's politics, I don't, it, it's not of interest to me. Now it has truly become personal. And I wonder if finally people are going to recognize how badly the deck has been stacked in the favor of the radical right. I do feel like that is... Um that is kind of the key to the Dobbs decision that as, as big as a decision as it has been for reproductive rights for women in this country. And has, you know, we've seen, we we've all seen how it has played out in elections that there's this additional factor, which I did not see coming and which I think is the real story of the 2022 election that it managed to bring together or create a sort of an overarching concept or explanation that brought in all these other things. You know, in the lead up to the 22, uh, 2022 election, there was this big sort of, you know, hair on fire debate among Democrats, like, do we make it all about abortion or do we make it all about democracy in, in January 6th? And that was, you know, so much back and forth and people so upset with each other. Um, and my take, at least, what we actually saw in the 2022 election is that voters did not see it in those binary terms. It became one big thing of these kind of scary people taking away rights and and that was maybe just your right to your vote to be even counted 
not even just in the in the voter suppression sense, but even the result. Maybe a re- maybe the result didn't even matter, or taking away reproductive rights. But it all became one thing, and and they melded in a way that uh, I I don't think a lot of commentators thought. Um, just final question. I know we're kind of we're running a little long on 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 time here. One of the issues you come back to a few different points in, in the book is is the is the idea of for lack of a better word elite immunity um lack of lack of accountability and and we're mixing you know mixing comps, eh, concepts a bit here but one of the basic questions coming out of reconstruction one of the reasons reconstruction failed is the fact that even though uh even though there was reconstruction, which which was in a lot of doubt at the very beginning after after um, the Civil War, that there were no real consequences for the people who had launched the Civil War, for the slaveholding class that had uh, broken the Union, caused the Civil War, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was certainly one of the basic uh, uh, reasons um, why reconstruction failed. But we've also seen it in the way Watergate played out, that at least at the top, there were there were no repercussions. Uh, you mentioned 1986 before as a turning point in terms of um, in terms of the uh, the character of the Republican Party. It was also a key point because that's Iran Contra, and uh, the fact that you had Iran Contra probably in large measure because there hadn't been any consequences uh, for Watergate, and now obviously we have January 6th. So, um, and. I, I think Kate actually has one more question after this, but how does how does elite immunity play out in our current moment, and especially with the you know uh, trials going on now with with Donald Trump and everything? So I maintain that if Richard Nixon had been indicted and tried, even if he had not been convicted, we would not have had Iran Contra. Donald Trump would never have run for president. We certainly would not have had January 6th because what we did is we established this idea that the president can't be touched, which is antithetical to absolutely everything that the the framers of the Constitution set out. But but I want to go back to, to line up why I think that really matters. And first of all, I reject the premise that Reconstruction failed because it's a, a very complicated story and there were many successes in Reconstruction. And I also want to point out what Re- Reconstruction meant to the people at the time. So literally, Reconstruction meant the reconstruction of the American government. And there's actually a moment at which Reconstruction in those terms was over. And that's the moment the Georgian uh, Georgian, uh, senators and representatives were sworn back into their seats after they'd been expelled uh, after the 1868 election. So, of course, we expanded to talk about a lot of very different things now, but, but there was a very specific thing that they were trying to do. And I think that kind of matters. Anyway. The reason that I'm I'm picking on reconstruction here is that Ulysses S. Grant and the people who supported the kind of approach to the South that he embraced at the end of the war wanted to um, to welcome the South back into the Union, and they truly believed that white Southerners would embrace the same kind of government that the Republicans had constructed during the Civil War. And that was a government that provided educations and that provided access to resources for poor people, whether they were white or black, and that uh, had new national money that enabled the businesses to grow, that you know, it was, was using the federal government to help ordinary Americans as it had never done before under the elite slaveholders. And they really thought that white Southerners would buy in, that they would like this so much that they were going to simply want to participate in it. And so long as people like Grant said to them, take your sidearms, take your mules, because mules are a really big deal um, in this period, you know, take your horses home, plant your fields and come on back. They really thought that they were going to construct a new kind of government. And so they didn't hold people responsible for what they had done, which is to kill, you know, uh, 600,000 people. 
which is to create 600,000 casualties and cost almost $6 billion over the past four years. And one of the things that I always like to point out about this is that in fact, during Reconstruction and ever since, we have had huge numbers of people who died because of that war. They were just the people who were on the side of the United States of America, that is black Americans. And if you think about the fact, if you had made treason odious in those first years after the war so that people ran away from it. They didn't want to be seen as Confederates. They didn't want to be, you know, have any association with Jefferson Davis or any of the people who might have been tried and probably hanged for their participation in that insurrection, that we would not have seen what we did see. We would not have seen the resurrection of the ideology of the Confederacy. We would not have seen the lionization of the Confederate cause. We would not have seen Confederate statues. We would not have seen the rise of the Confederate battle flag. We would not be where we are today well over 150 years later, I think. I can't do the math. Well over 100 (laughs) years later, take whichever one you want. Um, Well over 100 years later. And In that sense, the idea that it was going to be kinder to be nice to Jefferson Davis and to be nice to the Confederates could not have been more misguided. Over the long, you know, the long course of history, we would have saved so many more lives and made so much more successful in American society if, in fact, in the immediate aftermath of the war, we had held people to the law. And that's why I'm, you know, when people try and make the argument now saying, oh, it would be better for the society if Donald Trump were allowed simply to walk away. My answer is absolutely not, because we can't see how any of these things will play out. But what we can see is the incredible importance of holding firm to the rule of law and the idea that we are all equal before the law and the times that we have refused to uh to honor that principle are the times that have in fact poisoned our society more profoundly than virtually any others. So yeah, I think it really matters that we hold people equally to account before the law. Oh, that's so fascinating. So I I wanted to end on a potential glimmer of optimism here, which is you write in your book about how against global currents, you know, the United States resisted capitulating to fascism in the 1930s, even while, you know, kind of our allied countries, some of them did. And I was wondering if there are any kind of themes or narrative threads in that resistance that give you any hope now when it feels like we're at, you know, such a perilous moment. Yeah, I think the real surprise for me in this book was the theme that came out of it, which is not the one I set out to write. And that is, the, to my, to my mind, the answer to the question of why America did not become fascist in the 1930s, fully fascist, we certainly had fascist movements, was that unlike other countries that did succumb, America did have The United States of America did have this long history of marginalized Americans who recognized the principles of the Declaration of Independence, the idea that we should all be treated equally before the law and have a right to a say in our government, as crucial to humanity. So from the very beginning, from the very moments after that declaration was written, marginalized Americans who were excluded from it said, hey, those are great principles. What about me? And because of that, because they consistently kept those principles in front of the United States of America, in front of people saying, hey, this is what this country is supposed to be about, because of that, it enabled the United States to avoid falling fully into fascism in the 1930s. And that idea that those of us who are excluded in one way or another from the promise of this country continually pushing on that promise, continually saying, hey, wait a minute, you're not living up to your expectations, I think is what has always made the United States have great possibilities, never fulfilling them, of course. That's part of what it means to be a democracy, I think, is it's never finished. But those principles being constantly held up in front of us, I think, give us the potential not only to resurrect American democracy in this moment, but to do what those marginalized peoples have done since the beginning, that is to expand it, to make it ever include more people. And that's, you know, you think about the future, that seems to me to be more than a glimmer of hope, that seems to me to be a beacon. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. This has been such a fascinating conversation. 
Well, thank you for yeah, having absolutely. me. It's been a real really pleasure. Appreciate it. Belaboring the Point with Kate Riga is a TPM podcast. The show is hosted by me, reporter Kate Riga. The show is produced by the excellent Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to our good friend, Why Not Jansveld, for our podcast theme song. And thanks to our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen.